Prior to 1993, if one were to discuss the leading causes of death in the United States, the only acceptable list of answers was comprised of diseases. Heart disease, number one, cancer, number two, stroke, number three, diabetes, arguably, number four. That has been the way of it for decades. And the case could be made that's still the way of it. But in 1993, two preeminent epidemiologists, Bill Fagey and Mike McGinnis, published a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. And McGinnis and Fagey in that paper opened our eyes to something that probably should have been obvious all along. Namely, diseases are not causes. Diseases are effects. And the question was, effects of what? What are the causes of the diseases that are in turn the causes of premature death? What are the root causes of the diseases that were taking both years from life and perhaps more importantly life from years? And reached the conclusion that in 1990 the leading cause of premature death in the United States was tobacco use. The second leading cause was poor diet, the third lack of physical activity. And so 80% of almost all of the premature deaths that occur in this country attributable to those three factors. And because the mechanism of death was a chronic disease, again, we're not just talking about years lost from life. Bad enough. Even more so, we're talking about life siphoned out of those years. Back to Ford's study. Four factors, right? Smoke, yes or no. Eat well, yes or no. Active, yes or no. Weight controlled, yes or no. What they did in this study of 23,000 adults was compare the two ends of the spectrum. So they compared, I don't smoke, I eat well, I'm active, my weight is under control, to I smoke, eat poorly, I'm inactive, and my weight is out of control. These people had an 80% lesser likelihood over the course of their lives of developing any major chronic disease than these people, 80% less. So I think the case can be made. Indeed, I dare hope that the case has been made, that the master levers of medical destiny are not tools we wield in hospitals, not stethoscopes, scalpels, MRIs, or PET scans, but rather feet, forks, and fingers used well these exert the greatest power over our medical destiny yet confronted. The news is grim and worrisome because of course obesity is a canary in the coal mine of chronic disease. We don't talk about it because we care what we see when we look in the mirror. We probably all do by the way and I think that's fine. But that's not why somebody like me, a public health physician, devotes a career to this issue. One devotes a career to this issue because it is profoundly about health. Obesity is on the causal pathway to every major chronic disease that plagues our society. Every major chronic disease that takes years from life and life from years. It's a major risk factor for heart disease. It is a major modifiable risk factor for every cancer evaluated save two. Squamous cell carcinoma of the skin and primary tumors of the brain. But all the other cancers we worry about, breast and prostate and colon and lung and stomach and uterus, obesity is a major risk factor. But of course, the most indelible link between obesity and chronic disease is the link with diabetes. So for diabetes, we have trends every bit as dire as those for obesity. And here, too, we have projections looking into the future. And here, too, they're pretty ominous. The CDC is projecting again that should current trends persist, by or about the middle of this century, one in three adults in the United States will have diabetes. Because if this happens, if one in three of us by the middle of this century has diabetes, there's no way to pay that bill. Roughly 27 million Americans have diagnosed diabetes today. One in three means well over 100 million. We're struggling now. This bill cannot be paid. We will be insolvent as a nation. And so interestingly, whatever your day job and whatever mine, we find ourselves on nothing less than the front lines of homeland security as we talk about public health crises. Because unless we put out this fire, we're all going up in the conflagration. I don't see a way forward for the United States of America through this. 
when one in three of us has a severe, costly, potentially disabling chronic disease beginning at ever younger age. We cannot let this happen. Period. End of story. Frankly, I think by any reasonable definition, 50% of our kids or more nationwide are already caught up in this, and they are reaping the same metabolic whirlwind as their parents. Rampant insulin resistance in markedly overweight children and adolescents, oh yeah. Rampant type 2 diabetes among obese children and adolescents, yeah. And the unfortunate thing about saying that isn't just the fact of it but also the fact that it's a shock and awe statement that fails to evoke shock or awe. Over a year ago at the national meeting of the uh, Stroke Society, a paper was presented reporting a 35% increase in the rate of stroke among 5 to 14 year olds. The investigators themselves weren't sure why, except the only smoking gun on the scene was epidemic childhood obesity. Can you imagine anything more dreadful than a stroke? in a 10-year-old. This is where we find ourselves. As bleak as the news is about where we've been, the news about what could happen if knowledge were power, if we converted what we have long known into what we routinely do, is every bit as good. So let's take a look at the promise. But here's an example, ABC for Fitness. Going into schools for years, talking about the importance of physical activity, hearing about no child left behind, we got no time for that nonsense, we have to jettison recess, we have to jettison phys ed, more time for reading, writing, arithmetic, and I'd say, you mean to tell me no child left behind is leaving all the children on their behinds? And I'd hear back, yeah, it's too bad, please get out of my school. And I would go, but I wasn't happy about it. And the proper remedy for rambunctiousness in children is recess, not Ritalin. We take naturally rambunctious kids, send them to school, bolt them to chairs all day long. Thank you. So they can grow up to become adults. We can't get off couches with crowbars. These kids are telling us something. They need to get up and run around intermittently. Nuval, intended to be GPS for the food supply. We worked together for two years and developed the overall nutritional quality index algorithm, which factors in every nutrient that matters and generates a single score between 1 and 100, the higher the number, the more nutritious the food. The higher the average Nuval scores of their foods, the lower their risk of cardiovascular disease, the lower their risk of diabetes, the lower their body mass index, and the lower their risk of dying prematurely of any cause. You can improve your diet and your health one well-informed choice at a time. And as I suspect many of you know, Nuval is available in Connecticut in Big Y and Price Chopper supermarkets. It's currently available in 1,600 supermarkets in 30 states coast to coast, reaching close to 30 million people a week. And the company has scored over 100,000 foods. Believe it or not, there are 800,000 foods in the U.S. food supply. What I'm dishing out this morning isn't really detailed knowledge you didn't already have. If something is novel here, it's the synthesis. It's the fact that the problem is all around us and the solution will not come in a pill. It needs to be all around us as well. I'm convinced we and our children can escape our doom if we just see the elephant in the room. Thank you very much for your time and attention.